God. We're going to pray, and then we're going to let you be seated because I'm going to read my text um, a few minutes into my message. Father, we thank you for your goodness. I thank you for the word of the Lord, and I thank you for this privilege to preach this word to this people. I pray that you'll have your way in this place. God, we need your help, and we need your power, and I pray that you would work among us in a very special way. In Jesus' name, amen. Shake hands with somebody around you, and you may be seated. The title of my message, and I don't normally give it so early, but the title of my message is, What Keeps Me Here? And if we could put that title slide up. uh, What keeps me here? And I'm speaking in relationship to the church, and I don't mean the building per se, but in this thing called the church, what keeps me here, and what is it that keeps some of you here in the church, committed, serving, giving, worshiping, supporting, and attending, not just today, but every day living in the church or in the kingdom of God, every week. And every year, year after year, and in my case, since 1982, I look around this room and I ask the same question of some of you because there are some people in this building right now with us that have been in the church for a very long time. Amen. I think of my wife, Sister Shaw, and she's very young, but she started serving the Lord at 12 years old and And she's a grandma, and she has four grandchildren today, and she's been in the church since that period of time. I thought of Catherine Ansley, wherever she is. Is she here today? Uh, uh, (laughs) It's not a good day for me to have her in my notes if she's not actually present. But she was born in the church and born as... Uh, a family, a part of a family, her parents were in the church, and, and she is still attending church here today. I thought of my daughter-in-law, Stephanie, and where is she? Hopefully she's here. There she is. Uh, I'm, I'm running out of people. <laughs> Stephanie, who is a fourth generation in the church. In other words, not just her parents were in the church and not just her par- grandparents were in the church, but I believe her great grandmother was in the church and they are bringing their son Judah to church and they are fourth generation in the church. There are others that are here that have been here for 20 years and 25 years and some for 45 years and there are a bunch of people that have been here for over 50 years in the church and I'm not just talking about this building I'm talking about the church the the kingdom of God and the question that I'm asking is what is the glue that keeps some people in the church what is the motivating factor what is it that they see that some others do not see that keeps them in the church because This church has seen and the kingdom of God has seen literally hundreds of thousands of people who have been saved, who have been filled with the Holy Ghost and who have been forgiven of their sins. And they gave that all back to Jesus and walked off and did their own thing without the church while others, like some that are sitting in this building, some of you and myself perhaps I could say, Amen. There is nothing that could happen in our lives and no one that could come along that could cause us to quit the church. And so there was a story in the Bible that answers this question that I want to refer to and it will be the center of my message here today. And this is my text. It's found in the book of 2 Samuel. And you can remain seated because it is a long portion of Scripture. But it's 2 Samuel 9 verse 1. And we're going to read nine verses, and then verse 11 and verse 13, and it says, And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him, what's that word? Kindness for Jonathan's sake. And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. When they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the 
kindness of God unto him. And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan has yet a son which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he's in the house of Machir, in the, uh, uh, the, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. And that was a location. And d- then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and reverenced. And David said to Mephibosheth, And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertaineth to Saul and to all his house. Verse 11, then Ziba said, Ziba, unto the king, according to all thy, uh, my lord, the king has commanded his servants, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table. As one of the king's sons. Verse 13. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem. For he did eat continually at the king's table. And he was lame on both his feet. David remembered his best friend Jonathan. And how that Jonathan had made a covenant many years earlier. When David wasn't king. When David was actually just a part of the the kingdom of Saul. And Saul had a son, Jonathan. And Jonathan and David became best friends. But Jonathan looked at his father and he saw that though he started well, he become wicked. And God had uh, rejected him as from being the king and eventually the days on Saul being king were numbered and and the, and that meant the days on Jonathan would be numbered and that God was actually raising up David and that David would be the next king of Israel and so he called his friend aside and he said make a covenant with me in 1 Samuel chapter 20 verse 14 it says and thou shalt not and this is the covenant Covenant that he makes with David. He says, Thou shalt not only, while yet I live, show me the kindness. Notice the same word that's in our text. The kindness of the Lord that I die not, but also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my father's house forever. No, not when, da- when the Lord has cut off the enemies of, uh, uh, of David, every one from the face of the earth. And so David is remembering this. He's remembering the covenant. He's remembering his good friend Jonathan and now he's king and God has cut off all the enemies of of, uh, 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 of David and, 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 the, and the kingdom is consolidated underneath him and so he begins to look back over his time and he remembers Jonathan and he asks the question is there any left of the house of Saul? God had wiped out all of the house of Saul and it looked like there was no no one left from King Saul, who was the very first king of the, of the nation of Israel. And David said, is there any that is left of the house of Saul that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Somebody said, there is an old servant named Ziba, and if anyone would know, he would know. And so Ziba comes in and he asks him, is there any left? And Ziba says, Jonathan has yet a son, which is lame on his feet. I want you to notice that his name wasn't even mentioned. His name is Mephibosheth. But his name has not been mentioned yet. But his problem has been mentioned. Amen. His, His circumstances have been mentioned. He's lame on both his feet. Amen. I want you to understand what a pitiful picture Of a man this must have been. A man who had once been the son of royalty. A man whose grandfather was the very first 
king of the nation of Israel. Amen. This man, Mephibosheth, that is now a lame and crippled man, he was the, the descendant of a once great man, King Saul, and, and he had a fantastic heritage. But I want you to know today his most notable feature, his most, uh, his most underlined feature is that he is lame in both his feet. Amen. And what is so tragic about Mephibosheth was he wasn't made lame. He wasn't born lame. He became lame because when his grandfather Saul and his father Jonathan died in battle, as was the custom, you would kill all of the, of the king's children. Amen. And so when the news came that Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle as a result of the judgment of God on the house of Saul, that his nanny, his nurse, scooped up young Mephibosheth in her arms. He was five years old, the Bible says. And she ran, but when she ran, the Bible says she dropped him. And I don't know exactly the circumstance, how it happened, whether she dropped him down a flight of stairs or whether she fell down the stairs with him and, and her body came crushing down upon his lower limbs, his feet and his ankles. Amen. But despite that, the, no doubt the bones in his feet and ankles were shattered and broken. Amen. And, the, and they were left unattended and so broken bone grew back against broken bone until his feet had, had fixed themselves in a crooked and a, and a, a twisted state. And now here he is, a lame man. And he is a, a grown man and lame in both his feet. And he's not able to walk correctly. And so the news that David is calling for you finally reaches Mephibosheth and Lodabar. And I want to tell you, if you were Mephibosheth, you would be scared right out of your mind. Because David, if he had been like other heathen kings, he would have sought for all the seed, the children of the previous king, and killed all the descendants. And no doubt Mephibosheth was hiding out in Lodabar, fearing that David would ever come looking for him. And finally, there's a knock at the door, and someone says, David is summonsing you to the palace, and he wants you to come at once. And finally, the, the day he feared the most had come, and he was thinking probably in his mind that I'm going to be called to bear the judgment that is upon my, fa my family and my father's house. Hey Amen. In my mind's eye, I can see Mephibosheth as he comes in through the door. Amen. His eyes wide with fear, staggering and grunting with every step, puffing and breathing as his body contorts and twists at the, at the waist. Amen. As he comes in to the throne room of David. Amen. As he, as he makes his way down to the feet of David and he throws himself down at the feet of David. Amen. Ashamed and hopeless and afraid. Hallelujah. But what he hears from David's mouth is completely different than what he expects. Amen. It's not the, it is not the words of harshness. It is not the words of judgment or accusation. But David says to him, Amen. Do not fear, Mephibosheth, for I will surely show you the kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Amen. It would have been enough to hear that I'm restoring to you all that was lost because of your father's sins. But what blew Mephibosheth's mind is when the king said, You shall eat at my table continually. In verse 13 it says, You shall eat at my table 
as one of the king's sons. You're not going back to Lodabar, Mephibosheth. Amen. Lodabar meant pastureless. Nothing grew in Lodabar. It was the poorest land in all of Israel. Amen. But God, but, but David said to Mephibosheth, you won't be going back to Lodabar. You're going to eat at my table continually. Every day you're going to eat at my table as one of the king's sons. I'm here to tell you it was because of that word that he had spoken. Hallelujah. The word kindness. I will surely show you the kindness of the Lord for Jonathan's sake. That word kindness doesn't mean just polite. It doesn't mean I'm just going to treat you nicely. But it's the word that is found. Amen. It's the, it's the word that's found 240 times in the Old Testament. It is the Hebrew word kesed. And it means mercy. It means faith. Favor. Amen. It means uh, the goodness of God. It means grace. It is the theme of the New Testament. The Greek word that is equivalent to kesed is the word grace. By grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God. It is found in Psalm 23, the most famous psalm of the Bible in verse 6, where it says, Surely goodness and mercy... Surely goodness and kesed will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <laughs> Praise God. Hey Amen. He didn't just give lip service to the word kesed. But in 2 Samuel 9... Verse 13, it says, So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both his feet. You say, why does lameness matter? Why is it a part of the story? Amen, I'll tell you why. Because lameness was a, was a stigma in the Old Testament. Amen. It, for, it, it, it caused men, even though they were the descendants of Aaron, to be disqualified from their work in the temple. The Bible says in Leviticus 21, 18 and 19, it says, For whosoever man be that has a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man, or a lame, or he that is flat-nosed, or any things superficial uh, super whatever that word is uh, or a man that has a broken foot or a broken handed in Leviticus 21 uh, 21 it says no man that has a blemish of the seed of Aaron the priest shall come nigh to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire he has a blemish he shall not come nigh to offer the bread of God he was disqualified he was he was not allowed to come near the holy things because his language Lameness carried with it a stigma. You say, what is that stigma? It points to something in the New Testament. It's a picture of the spiritual deformity caused by the sin and the sinful nature in the lives of people that are descendants from Adam. Amen. The Old Testament was symbolically representing the stigma of sin. And I don't know about you, but sin is what makes us lame. Before God. Sin is what makes us lame before God. Sin will make you walk crooked. It'll cause you to have a hard time keeping your walk in the ways of God. It'll cause your foot to turn out of the way as the Bible describes. It'll keep us from being holy and right in the sight of God. So my question is why would he want this stigma at the most significant and dignified table in all of Israel. Why would David say to Mephibosheth, you're not going home to Lodabar, but I want you to stay and be at my table and eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Amen. This was the most dignified table in all of Israel. Amen. Dignitaries ate there. Priests would come and eat there. Foreign kings and foreign dignitaries would come and eat there. Generals from the 
the army would eat there. And most importantly, his sons, his children would eat at his table. But David was extending the kindness of God. He was extending the mercy of God and the grace of God. And so Mephibosheth was called to eat at this table continually. I want you to imagine with me what it would have been like to be a fly in the wall when everybody gathered at the table, when everybody would come. Hey, man. And they would all be looking so perfect, all the dignitaries and all the king's sons. And there they would be sitting there with their perfect looks and their perfect clothes and their perfect bodies and their perfect procession as they made their way in to the table and sat in an orderly fashion. And then in comes Mephibosheth. Hey Amen. Mephibosheth, where his clothes, though fine, were not sitting on his body quite the, the same as all the other sons. Hey Amen. Why? Because he would come to twisting and weaving into the, into the banquet hall to sit at the table. Amen. His, 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 his clothes scuffed and stained from perhaps falling on his way as he made his way to the table, staggering and twisting and puffing. Amen. Trying with every step I can imagine him as he's walking, how he's trying. Amen. To look like everybody else. And he's trying to, to walk like everybody else. Amen. As he's walking and he's twisting. Amen. His body is heaving from one side to another. And he's saying, I just wish these feet would allow me to walk right. But there he is. The tension fills the room. He can feel everybody waiting on him and staring at him. Amen. As he makes his way to the table. Oh, how I wish those feet would be straight. Why do you do this, Mephibosheth? Why do you put yourself through this? Why not just go somewhere else? Why not just live somewhere else? Why not say thanks for the offer? But I'll eat at another table where everyone doesn't look so perfect to me and where it doesn't seem like in comparison I'm so different. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why he kept coming. I'll tell you why he kept showing up. It was because of that one word. The kindness of God. The kindness of God. It doesn't say this in the Bible. This is from Jewish tradition. But according to Jewish tradition, once Mephibosheth sat at the table, two servants were called, and they would stretch the tablecloth over the feet of Mephibosheth while he sat at the table, and they pulled the tablecloth over his feet. In those moments, Mephibosheth could look up. Nobody could see he was lame anymore. Nobody could see the twisted and deformed feet any longer. Amen. Mephibosheth, for those moments, amen, could say, I look just like everybody else. I feel just like everybody else. Not even the king can see my lameness. I'm just like everybody else. Hallelujah. Thank you, Mephibosheth. I find this story so moving because there's a spiritual picture that we all should be able to identify with because when we look at our own spiritual origins and understand our royal and kingly family tree, we can go back, all of us, all the way to the beginning, to the very first king that ever existed on the face of the earth. And his name was Adam. Amen. God said, I give you dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over everything that creepeth upon the earth. I make you the king. I make you the ruler. I give you authority. I give you dominion. Amen. He was the first king that ever existed. But not long 
long after he made him that way. Amen. There was a failure in the Garden of Eden. There was a fall in the Garden of Eden. And I got news for you. When Adam fell in the Garden, he had all of us in his arms. When he fell, all of us were a part of his fall. And the weight of his body came crashing down on our own bodies and on our own souls and it has left us with lameness inside of us I don't know if you can follow me hallelujah from that day until now we have been lame in our own feet From that day until now, we've all struggled with weakness and crookedness. We've all struggled with the inability to be perfect and right in God's eyes. We have all struggled with a brokenness, a twistedness, a deformity within our inner man. That has hindered our walk with God. Amen. We weren't created this way. But we've all been affected by the fall of Adam. We've all been made weak towards sin. Twisted in our heart. Wayward in our walk. Amen. A sinner at the the, the, at, at the very center of our nature. Hallelujah. Hiding. Hiding from God in our own Lodabar. Amen. The land where nothing grows. The land of sadness and emptiness. The land of spiritual poverty and the land, amen, where there's nothing uh, but hopelessness and sadness. Hallelujah. But the son of David, Jesus Christ by name, has called out to all of us, the son of David, Jesus Christ has called to Lodabar and he has said, I desire to show you the kindness of God. Hallelujah. Hey Amen. I want to restore to you what your father lost a long time ago. I want to bring you to my table where you can eat with me as one of the king's sons. Psalm 23, amen, says, he prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. I sit at his table. And in the verse we already read, it says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to ask the question. Amen. Why, God? Why would you want to deal with me? I'm just a dead dog. I'm just nothing. I'm just nobody. Amen. But you have brought me to your table. Amen. And you have brought me into your church. I never forget my first time. Amen. Coming into the doors of a church like this. Amen. A lost sinner. Amen. A man that was bound by his sin. As I walked through the door with my own brokenness and my own lame lameness and my own twistedness. I remember coming in feeling I was the only sinner in the building. Amen. I could feel the tension in the room at where it felt like everybody was looking just at me. Amen. I remember sitting in the pews hoping that nobody would see my addiction. Nobody would see my perversion. Nobody would see my sin. Nobody could see how bad I was in my past. Amen. But I came walking through the door bearing my lameness. Amen. But there was only one reason while I was there. There was only one word that called me there. And that was the grace of God. That was the mercy of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. I came though I felt so out of place. I don't look like I belong here. Anybody remember those first times? As you walk in, 
I don't look like these people. I don't know how to act like these people. As you come in with your lameness. Amen. I don't know how to be like these people. I don't feel like I, I belong in this place. I don't know about you, but that's how I came into the church. I don't feel like I belong in this house. Amen. What am I doing here? These people have their perfect bodies and their perfect clothes and their perfect hair and, and their perfect worship. And they have everything in place. And they know just what to do, when to stand and how to clap and how to say hallelujah and how to pray and I know nothing all I know is that I look different and I feel different than anybody else but there's one thing that keeps me coming and there was one thing that attracted me in the first place and that is when I come in and sit at the table as I'm here in the presence of God Something happens. Something happens to me. There's a covering that's placed over me. There's a covering. It's not a tablecloth, but it's the blood of Jesus. It's the blood that cleanses. Though my sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as white as wool. There's something that happens to me in the presence of God. His grace covers me. His love covers me. His mercy covers me. And I look like everybody else. I've been here a long time. I came in in 1982. I was 20 years old when I walked through the doors of the United Pentecostal Church in Alfred Street. I had a lot of junk in my life. I had a lot of stuff, and he washed it all away, and he filled me with the Holy Ghost, and it transformed my life. Hallelujah. This may come to a sh as a shock to some of you, though, that though I have a holy God living inside me, and that holy God has brought such healing to the lameness in my life. I'm still aware. I'm still aware of the weaknesses. I'm still aware that but for the grace of God, there go I. I'm still aware and there have been times over the last 35 or 6 years that I've been in the church, amen, where I walk through the doors. And i got to tell you, I didn't feel very much like one of the children of God. I felt very much like the man from Lodabar. Because on my, on my knees and on my clothes were the stains of wear. My foot gave out again. That foot that I had wrapped so many times. That foot that I'd taken such care of and that the Holy Ghost worked on. And it felt like everything was perfect. Amen. But then out of the blue, when I wasn't expecting it, it would give again. And down I would go. I would come into the house of God. And I could feel the shame and the guilt. And the regret. Maybe nobody like Maybe nobody but me is like this. I, 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 maybe I'm the only one here that's like this that still has some lameness left within my nature. Some weakness in my nature. Some, uh, some area of my life that the, Satan continues to reach out to to try to tempt me in. Maybe I'm the only one. Maybe all of you are perfectly healed and perfectly well put together. But sometimes since that first time, amen, where he covered me, since that time over the last 35 years, there have been times that I've walked into the doors of the church and I didn't feel very much 
much like a son of God. I, I didn't feel very much like, hey man, the Holy God was living in me. Hey man, but the only reason I came, the only reason I showed up again, hey man, the devil said, why don't you just live somewhere else? Why don't you go somewhere else? Why don't you pack it in? Hey man, and just quit this thing. Hey man, but there was one thing that kept calling to me, and that was that word, the cassette of God, the kindness of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, if our musicians could come. Hallelujah. I asked the question, what is the glue? What is the glue that keeps some of us coming back? Amen. What do the stayers have that the quitters don't? What do the people that stay for generations and generations have that those who stop in for a year or two and then move on don't have? Here's the only thing I can think of because I, I'm looking in my own life. We've tasted the grace of God, and it is so sweet. <laughs> we, forget, we, we felt the delivering joy of forgiveness, and we said we can't live without it. We need it, we need it again and again, and we need it every day of our life. Hallelujah. We've come to understand and ex by experience the mercy of God. We saw our shortcomings and continue to see our shortcomings. And, and, and we see the grace of God that keeps calling for us. Amen. We sang a song earlier. It talks about, you know, he'll knock down walls and he'll break through whatever he, to, 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 to come after us. I tell you, that's exactly what the grace of God is like. I tell you what, though I may give up on God, he doesn't give up on me. Amen. Though I sometimes feel like I want to quit, God never feels like it. He wants to quit on me. His grace reaches. His grace keeps working. His grace keeps loving. His grace keeps calling me back to the table. And there at the table of the Lord, He covers me and forgives me one more time. I'm not giving an excuse to sin. I'm not saying you can live any old way you want and then that the Lord will just forget all about it. It doesn't matter to him. I'm not preaching that kind of sermon. The kind of people that I'm preaching about who've tasted the grace of God have an appreciation of the price that was paid for the grace of God. It was the blood of Jesus Christ. So what keeps us? What's the glue What's the thing that brings us back? Is it fear? Am I just afraid I'll be lost and go to hell if I don't serve Jesus? No. You can't live in fear all the time. Fear wears off. They drop bombs in the street and children become so used to the bombs that have dropped they still play in the streets with the, with the buildings totally scarred by the effects of the bombing and the bullets you get over fear is it duty I serve him because it's the right thing to do even though it is right I'm here to tell you that duty can only take you so far and duty will only make you live for Jesus so long but when you look at his grace when you look at his mercy Paul said I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice unto God holy and acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service I beseech you by the mercies of God when you've gone to Calvary that's where I started and you kneel at Calvary and you see the blood <laughs> and you see the blood of Christ 
And you know that every drop of blood was to cover my sins and your sins. When you've been there and you felt the warm blood, so to speak, and you know it was a holy God, you will never be the same. That will never wear off. You'll never get over that sight. It'll embed itself into your memory and into your heart. And you'll never be able to shake it. And the days when you just don't feel like it, you're tired and you'd rather be somewhere else and you'd rather do something else. And man, I'd rather just, you know, live the life of joy and sin like everybody else. I take another look and I realize the grace and the mercy of God that is reaching for me. And it's what keeps me here. It's what keeps me here. Could we all stand? I preach too long. Is there anybody that says... I want that grace to cover me again. I want that mercy to cover me again. I want that blood to cover me again. I want him to wash me clean again. Doesn't matter how many times you failed, if you mean it with all your heart, he'll wash you and cover you and make you white as snow. If that's you today, why don't you step out from where you are and we're going to come to the front of this church. We're going to call upon Jesus Christ and we're going to ask him to continue to cover our lives. Would you do that? Lord Jesus, here I am today. I need your covering one more time. I want to give you thanks for your mercy and your grace toward me. I want to give you praise for being kind toward me. I know I don't deserve it, Jesus. I know, Lord, I can't lay claim to the table, but Lord, you've called me. And you've said, come, eat at my table continually. Hallelujah, I will wash you and I will cleanse you, you have said to me. If I would just come before you. And so here I am, Jesus, one more time. Here I am, Jesus, one more time. Cleanse me and wash me. Hallelujah. As the singers sing, would you call on Jesus Christ? Hallelujah, one more time.